Okay. This is an interview at Division of Military Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York. It is the 8th of March, 2007, approximately 3 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Sergeant First Class, Michelle Renee Lindsay, November 29, 1970. Where? Oh, I'm sorry. That's Danville, okay. Illinois. Okay. What was your education? educational background prior to entering service? A high school graduate um, and then a year later after high school I entered into the military and active duty. Okay, um, so you enlisted into the Army? I did. Why? After uh, high school I worked two jobs and discovered that it wasn't fulfilling um, there wasn't much potential to go beyond um, just working job to job. And I always liked the discipline of the military. Kind of grew up that way with a stepfather who was a former service member and, and knew that it's something that I enjoyed and thought it was something that I, I, I would like to try to do. So after a year trying my luck in the private sector, I decided to join the military. Um, it was a quick thought, and uh, I followed through with it, and was quite pleased that I joined. I stayed out. Um, I was in the uh, delayed entry program for three months before shipping out uh, in September of 1990. Where'd you go to basic training? I went uh, to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, as well as doing my advanced individual training there for an administrative specialist, Sydney William. Okay. And what was that school like? Well, basic training, I'll, I'll start with, with that. Okay. Uh, I remember uh, one of my first memories um, was that uh, I was with a whole bunch of women, which um, I found not to my liking. And I just kept remembering that I couldn't wait for training to start so that uh, they would suffer. I was okay with suffering as long as they would suffer because I discovered several women together really teenagers, what they were, 18, 19, 20, um, that that's, that's, not the, uh, that, that's not the best group to be in the middle of. And, and therefore, I was just pleased to get on with the training so that I knew everyone would become a more disciplined group. And once that did begin, um, I found it not too much of a challenge. I discovered that what I didn't like about my stepfather gave me an advantage. I, I knew not to speak out of turn. I knew um, that you know the next day would come. So whatever your failures were that day, that it, it didn't mean much. You had to just you know think about what you're going to do the next time, and and you more than likely come out successful. So um, I learned very early on to to work as a team, to you know just kind of believe in myself that. Um, I wasn't the only one going through the, the pains of the training that everyone else was and, and so I would um, kind of assess myself and say, you know, is that person stronger than me? And I always came up with the answer, no they're not. So that kind of helped me to get through the training. And uh, my discipline that was influenced by my, my father, um, eventually, um, you know, it, it actually began to be something that the drill sergeants noticed. Um, they selected uh, their leadership based on um, education. So the platoon guide was uh, um, someone who held, held a degree, she was a specialist, and the assistant platoon guide was uh, someone who, um, she held, I think, an associate's degree, so she was a PFC. So the two of them together, we quickly learned, was not the best leadership for the group. And uh, the uh, platoon guide, she was replaced for a lack of ability um, to, sh to perform in front of others. She, she just wasn't a leader. And so the assistant moved up. At that time, I was the uh, company guide on. And um, I don't know if it was because I had a big mouth or, or what it was, but I was the guide on and, um, and, and enjoyed it. And I would put on a show running around with the guide on and, you know, uh, making everyone yell while, while I was 
running around a formation waiting to place the guide on into the sand of Fort Jackson. And um, soon what happened was when the replacement of leadership happened, um, they did it one more time. They moved the squad leader as the assistant. And uh, that didn't work out. And the senior uh, platoon sergeant, he uh, selected me to be the assistant. And uh, after that, um, it was apparent to them that I was the right fit to be the platoon guy. And so that change happened. And, and then I was smart. Um, I didn't want to be the bad cop. So when he said I could select um, my assistant, which was the first time they, they, they felt that I had the ability to, to get the right, um, the right soldier to work with me, I, I picked what I call the bad cop. So, so I didn't have to be the mean person all the time. So, I got the meanest, toughest squad leader that was uh, already already assigned uh, to move up and work with me, and, and the combination worked well. And I discovered quickly, being a leader is about common sense and about putting others before yourself. And what I learned back then applies today. So I uh, learned a great deal in basic training, and and uh, but was glad to move on to uh, AIT, which was unfortunately for me. Uh, just down the road. Uh, it was a two-minute ride down the road um, for administrative training. And um, that wasn't a bad thing at all. Um, you had more freedoms. Um, and the, the training was boring, and so it wasn't too difficult. And, you, and I got through it with, with no problem. And uh, at the end of that training, um, I was headed uh, in one direction, and my entire class was headed to the Gulf War, and um, that was that was kind of emotional actually because um, at that point you bonded with people. Many of them you went through basic training with, and then you went on to uh, AIT with them, and so you want to be with those that you know, especially when you go to war, and. Um, even those that, I, that even those that I didn't really like so much, they they were my brothers and sisters, so to speak. So I wanted to be with them, and I was headed, unfortunately, um, in my mind at the time, to uh, airborne school. So as my class shipped out, I went in the other direction um, to complete some additional training, and I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, to do that. So you went to jump school. I did. I did, and um, it, three, it's, it's three weeks. Three weeks. Um, I got to jump school at the end of zero week, and I'm glad that that happened. The reason I was a bit delayed was because I had a stomach virus um, before departing Fort, Fort Jackson. It, I claim it's the food. Uh, they claimed it might have been something else. But at any rate, when I, I arrived there, training was about to begin, and um, it was the most uh, intense, most professional training I have been to today. And uh, I, I've been in for more than 15 years now, and my experience at jump school with the black hats sticks out in my mind and has somewhat um, defined me as a leader. Uh, one of the things I remember about jump school is that um, they didn't mess with your time. They treated you as a professional. They, uh, they wanted you to get into the training, do it well, and then they released you to, uh, you know, uh, kind of relax in your evening. And I just, I remember the first evening there that I looked up at the Georgia skies and, and thought it was the most gorgeous sunset I have ever seen. And today I have to say, I, I don't think that I ever had one of those moments. So I don't know if it was because I had my first taste of freedom in the military, um, or actually the skies were more beautiful than any other place in the world, but um, that's one of those standout moments. And, and I, I was prepared for training and you know, I thought, you know, no fear. I felt safe with the black hats. They were professional. They were tough. Um, they would encourage you daily to quit because they, they were trying to weed out those who really weren't meant to be um, paratroopers and, and those who uh, Who were the black hats? They so, were, so oh, watching yes. This. Yes, uh, they <laughs> were the instructors. Know. They were mm -hmm. the cadre there. And um, uh, one of the, our favorites, or at least mine, I won't speak for everyone, was the guy who we called the milk and cookies man. He would come out every morning to try to figure out who, who couldn't quite make it that day. So he would uh, offer us milk and cookies and you know hot coffee and donuts if we would only 
go ring the uh, bell that they had um, in front of the formation. Um, you know, why go through this tough training when you could be in the warmth of the office and not have to deal with the black hats and the rigorous training they were going to put you through. So I got a kick out of that and, you know, that's that really motivated me to say it won't be me, I won't be the one going up there. Um, and throughout the whole training uh, with the black hats, um, you, you wouldn't know one from the other. Many times in the ranks of leaders, you you have your favorites and you have those that you, that you don't like. Um, but I don't remember anyone that I thought lacked professionalism or the ability to do what they were supposed to do for us. And, and so I enjoyed that training. Um, how many people dropped out? Oh, boy, I don't remember now, but it was quite a few. Uh, what's most unique is um, in the particular company that I was in, Delta Company, Delta Rock, um, they were doing an experiment. They were testing, um, doing a test to see if women could train alongside men. So um, you, the standards were still as the Army dictated them to be, but um, doing the training as far as uh, the, the physical runs in the morning and, and whatever else that was that entailed physical training that day. Um, I, I believe they probably slowed down the pace some, but it was just a bit more than what was expected for women or what has had taken place up to that point for women. And um, so in the end, of, I wish I remember the number, but it was a large number, and I want to say um, 60, but I think that might be because my number was 60. That's how I was identified. I never had a name. Um, of the women that were there, only seven, I believe, graduated, and, and I was among those seven. And we're talking quite a few. Um, there were, I think there were like six platoons of, of personnel there, so there were quite a few women that began, certainly a small percentage compared to the men, but um, not many of us made it through, so I was, I was pretty proud of making it through that system. And it, it's, a, it's a pair, because I still remember my number, six zero. And, uh, but you know, it wasn't an offensive thing. It, it was almost like a thing of pride, you know, your number being called, whether it was for good or bad, um, it was your identity and, and you became proud of it. Um, six zero making it across um, the, the uh, threshold of the uh, entrance into the aircraft, making it out on that, you know, first jump. Um, that's a pretty big thing, you know, when they, they come to you and say, oh, six zero, you made it. Um, they might as well, you know, just said my given name. Um, you know, it, I couldn't have been any, even, any more prouder than that. How'd you feel on your first job? Um, I was terrified. <laughs> I, I was, I was scared, and um, if no one else in the world will admit it, um, every jump since I was terrified. But what I remember um, is that, because it was the unknown, um, I felt confident that what those black hats said would happen, very well would. So it, it wasn't the, uh, it, it wasn't faith in what I had learned and what should have happened. It, it was truly the unknown and, and, my, and uh, my ability to react um, like, I sh like I should. But because everything else went in sequence, um, everywhere from um, how they trained us, uh, the countdown and, and letting us know, you know, there's one minute, 30 seconds, and you know, stand by, and, and, and you know what's coming next, and, and because it came, it got it got easier as I got closer and closer to the door. Green light, go, you don't have time to think. They're just moving you, pushing you out. That stick pusher, the person who's last uh, um, in the back of the aircraft, they're pushing you because they want to get out before that uh, green light turns red. Um, so as I remember, leaping out and uh, even though it was daytime it was probably night for me I probably had my eyes closed um, you know I remember in my mind counting 1,000 2,000 3,000 I felt the jerk before I got to four and I relaxed I said okay you know everything was going as it should have gone and you know as I came down it was it was a pretty perfect day in that for um, jumpers uh, no winds in the skies um, you know you're gonna have a soft landing although that's not what I knew we were so high on that first jump that all I could remember is how peaceful it was, how I 
how I was descending and it was you know kind of graceful and peaceful and I had time to look around and um, you know I kind of lost myself in that moment not thinking about the danger that waited beneath me so you know it's not until you, you know you, you the, the black hats they bring you back to reality because you can start to hear them and they're just a speck on the ground and uh, they're yelling out all the steps that you're supposed to be taking and as you got to a certain point they would be yelling out what you're supposed to be doing next for those who got too caught up in the moment and I don't recall that I, I got too caught up but perhaps um, and, and then I went into the rest of my sequence of uh, what you're supposed to do upon ascension and uh, I remember my landing just being as soft as could be as if um, they created it that way for us that first time out you know doing the little crawl and making sure we, we couldn't be hurt. That's what it felt like, that um, every jump was going to be that way. And uh, I remember the black hat, one of them on the ground with the megaphone, uh, yelling to a guy, fall down, fall down, do a PLF, a parachute landing fall, um, because not every landing is soft. That particular day, you could stand up, but um, I would soon find out on my second jump uh, that that's not the way it goes. Um, and uh, that second jump, um, I hope no one else has ever done this, but I got the wind knocked out of me because I, I don't recall if it was windy, but the way that I came down um, ended up uh, me not hitting any of the proper points of contact. Um, balls of the feet, maybe I hit um, my calf, perhaps, but after that, I landed um, with my chest right on my uh, reserve and uh, and I was spread eagle arms out legs out so I'm not quite sure what I did but it was wrong and uh, and, and got the wind knocked out of me fortunately you, you know as I lie there and collected myself I realized I was okay um, and uh, got on up and, and was able to return to training but in that jump I had injured my foot and uh, perhaps that's what went wrong and I don't know how I got turned around but um, after that jump my my foot was injured and I had to go see uh, I had to seek medical attention and uh, that was the first time uh, someone in the military discovered how poor my feet were they're they're flat by birth and um, don't have a lot of padding in the balls of the feet so I had to be recycled um, to another company so soon after because I couldn't jump again um, uh, just with the profile, just making sure I was okay, there was a day delay and I had to go to Alpha Company, which I didn't take too kindly to. Uh, Delta kind of made us feel like we were the elite, we were the best, and, and I think so. Um, we weren't located with anyone else, uh, any of the other three companies. We were up on a hill uh, about a mile away from the training site and we ran every day um, to training to Chow. So we were running off often. So not only did they make them unique in integrating women into their their physical training sessions, but um, they did so in, in a way that made us just appear that we were set apart from everyone else. But I did get through the training. Um, I did three jumps, um, two and two and one in one day, and the next I did one jump and. Uh, and I was dismissed. No one really noticed me. I went off on my own. They gave me my wings and they were going to pin them, but I declined the offer and walked and found my original black hat um, conduct, in the middle of conducting training for a new cycle that went through. And, um, and it was kind of neat because he didn't expect it. Um, some of the other black hats thought that I wasn't going to make it and he, he had faith in me. He said, oh, she'll make it. And she'll be back, and uh, and and that's what happened. And so they did a little ceremony for me. It was it was kind of cool. They uh, not that we were supposed to do it, but uh, the traditional ceremony is is to give blood wings, and so they did their their version of that, and, and they were kind. Um, one black hat um, stood behind me and and you know held his hands up at my shoulder to brace me, and and then my uh, black hat, he um, took the backings off of the, uh, the pin-on uh, airborne wings and he, uh, he, you know, he made the gesture as if he was going to really jam them in there and, and uh, 
he did, he gave me a little tug and, you know, a little push there, but uh, uh, certainly not the, the, the uh, norm that we normally hear about uh, those type of rituals. So, um, but for a while I had a couple little dents in, uh, <laughs> in my chest, but I, I tell you, um, it, it didn't seem like it was uh, any type of a hazing ritual or anything like that. It, it was it was a proud moment, and, and so I guess I can see where, where the infantry men, when they do things that we deem as unnecessary and barbaric, um, I can see where they're coming from. Um, when you know something is 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 a norm or a a tradition, mm -hmm. and uh, so in that moment when I I got my uh, my wings, I I thought, you know, I I thought I accomplished something big, and and you couldn't tell me anything. Um, you could have told me how to shine boots because I didn't know how, but um, I remember going back after my little ceremony and getting packed up and ready to go and had made my arrangements um, to get myself to an airport an hour away. <coughs> um, I remember my trying to shine my boots and one of the black hats from Alpha Company came in and she she says, oh, those things look like uh, a chocolate bar. You need, and I had just gotten done. I thought, oh, this is great. <laughs> And she said, you need to do something about that soldier. And, All right, airborne, get, you know, work on those boots. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? I stayed up all night to work on those boots. And they didn't look any better than when she, she saw me. But fortunately, when as I departed to get in, into the cab, no one really saw me. So um, uh, I thought, OK, I, I'm in the clear there. But um, it was a lasting impression, her words, you know, about shining the boots. And that's what airborne personnel wear highly shined boots, and uh, I ended up finding a, 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 one of those uh, shoe shine uh, uh, boots in the airport, and he did a great job. And after that, I was all set. I was looking good. Now, where did you go from there? I, I went home on leave. Um, I had my Class A uniform on. Um, my parents picked me up at the airport, and you know, and they hadn't seen me for a while. I had been away for about six months because of uh, the basic AIT, and there always seemed to be little breaks in between. I think we had a um, Christmas exodus, and I don't really recall if I went home. I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't. I'm not sure what happened there, but, so they hadn't seen me in a while, so I went home. Uh, they were very proud, of, of course. Um, even though I had one ribbon on my uniform and then the shiny airborne wings, of course. Um, so, you know, I thought I looked sharp. I thought I was, you know, like everybody was looking at me. And uh, and they might have, but I don't think that they saw me in the way that I, I felt that day, the way I thought they should have been looking at me. But my parents were pretty proud and, um, you know, and that was the first time that it was truly evident to them that they thought I did something, something unique, because it, it was, something that no one else had really done in the family. I had a cousin who did it, um, but in our immediate family, since uh, my father, um, I was the first to, to really do something um, what we thought was special, and they could actually see the results of that. So. And what happened when you went back? Where did you go? Um, well, after I finished uh, my time at home, um, I went to uh, Fort Bragg, and that didn't alarm me um, initially. I thought, okay, there's a lot of things going on at Fort Bragg, I'm sure. I didn't, I didn't really know anything. Um, and I remember going to 18 Airport for the replacement company, and uh, there was a day that uh, a sergeant came out, and um, he uh, said, all right, we're in formation. He said that the following names that I call, they will be getting on this truck. Um, and they're going to be shipping out to the 82nd Airborne Division. So I'm thinking, oh, wow, we're going to see who's going. Well, he called off some names, and then he got to Lindsay. And, uh, and I said, oh, excuse me, Sergeant, I'm a female. Lindsay's a female. He said, I know, get on the truck. And uh, my mouth dropped because what I was told um, is that uh, by my recruiter that women don't do airborne duty. So when I was in the recruiting station, we were figuring out what job I was going to do and what other training was available. He showed me an airborne tape, and uh, you know, I thought, oh, that looks pretty neat. 
well, first of all, the tape was outdated, so all that fun stuff I thought I was going to be doing, I didn't do any of that. Um, and then he said, because women aren't in combat units, they're not in airborne units, I thought, oh, wow, they let you just do this cool training, and then you get to go on and do other stuff. And then I said, all right, I can do that. Well, I found out the hard way that recruiters sometimes either, I won't necessarily <laughs> say they're, they lie, but maybe they're not up on what's happening out in the field sometimes. So, actually for this one I would say it's, it's probably a lie. But anyway, um, so I, get up, I got on the truck and um, the whole way to 18 Airborne Corps, I was, you know, I was in shock. I was scared and I thought, well, I didn't think I'd be doing this for a living. And, uh, but soon I discovered, well, it, it's too late now. You, you've done the training, you're qualified. Um, you got to get through this thing. And I figured um, it, it was a great experience in training, so it couldn't be all that bad. So I soon accepted, you know, my fate, so to speak, and, you know, went on to the 82nd Airborne Division Replacement uh, Company. Once I was there, um, everything was pretty uneventful. I mean, more freedom than um, any of us really needed to have. Um, you know, you, you do what taskings they have you to do that day and then they release you and and uh, then the people you know they young young folks you, they sometimes have a tendency to, to party a little more than they needed to fortunately I was somewhat grounded I wasn't a big partier but um, you know I I went out of bed and you know kind of checked the, the scene out but I wasn't really a drinker in, in that way so it, I had the appearance of being with the crowd without really participating in everything that they do and uh, soon, people who drink a lot, they don't realize that you're not drinking either. Uh, they get oblivious to that. Um, and they stop asking you, do you want another drink? you want another drink? So, uh, especially when I'm milking a Sprite all night. So, <laughs> they don't realize it. But what happened while I was in the uh, 82nd Airborne Division Replacement Center, I was called one day with, I believe it was, believe it was three other privates. And uh, we were told that we had to go through an interview for a position in the Inspector General Office. Well, I didn't know what that was. So basically, because they were looking specifically for 71 Limas and we were the four that were in the replacement center at the time. So I do my interview and, uh, you know, I'm not getting an ind indication of anything one way or the other because I don't want this job. Uh, not that I didn't want it, but I, I was indifferent um, to it. But through the interview, I thought, well, gee, if you're, if you're getting interviewed for this thing, um, it must be a pretty special job. So, um, you know, I put my best foot forward, of course, and, um, and then, then wanted it, not realizing what it was still. So in the matter of the half hour or so that I was interviewed, I went from, you know, okay, so I'm doing this to not really caring about one way or the other about the job to the end of it, getting excited, thinking, well, I'm, this must be something special. So, um, the day late, a day later, I was called in the office and was told that I was selected for the position. So I was pretty excited. Um, and that experience in the Inspector General's office defined me completely. Um, that's where I learned how to be uh, a true soldier, uh, a leader, um, how to balance a lot of things, and how to accept um, disappointment how to uh, um, bounce back from that disappointment, how to set goals, um, how to accept that you don't know everything, um, how to accept that um, one day someone's going to be better than you, someone's going to tell you what to do that perhaps you're brighter than. Uh, those guys taught me a lot. The office was made up of primarily men. My immediate supervisor who interviewed me um, she was the only other woman, and she was a sergeant, um, E5. And the inspections team themselves, they, it was seven positions, um, rounding out the, t the main areas of um, uh, the uh, specialty MOSs um, in the Army, like logistics, medical, maintenance, um, admin, um, and food service. Uh, it, I'm sure I'm leaving out something, but pretty much, they were the best of the best with the ability to um, look at the programs of others. 
and, and around the, the 82nd Airborne Division and tell them how to improve um, what they had in, in existence. And there was a Sergeant Major, and, uh, and I'll never forget Sergeant Major Malolo. He was mean, he was old school, and uh, he terrified me on a regular basis. Um, I was the only person in our company who would get room inspections. And I remember my first, I scrubbed it from head to toe the whole, whole weekend. I, I cleaned in areas that I knew he would look and areas that I wouldn't think anybody would look, uh, like my, the springs in my bed. I mean, everything I cleaned it. The only place that I did not clean was the place that he looked. <laughs> And that was the, uh, uh, on the, the uh, it was a vent system, I believe, in, in the sil on the ceiling. And I couldn't reach it. And, uh, and it wasn't safe for me to try to rig something up to reach it. So he had a white glove, literally, and uh, went around the room and thought, uh, did a good job. He says, but I know where you didn't get it. And of course, then, um, you know, I didn't reach perfection for the SAR major, so there was dis disappointment that set in. Um, but one thing that SAR major Malolo did show me that he did care because no one was allowed to talk to his private. No one was allowed to discipline her except for him. So anyone outside of our office, um, he, he protected to make sure that they did not bother me. If they needed to know something about me, he wanted to be the person that they asked. And so that showed me that deep down that he did care, and, and um, but he made up for it. If no one needed to mess with me. He did it, He did plenty, so I, I didn't need any um, outside assistance at all. Um, but he, he taught me, one of the lessons he taught me early on, and, and I just think this is funny, and I tell this to uh, soldiers junior to me today. I, to, I tell the story of how the division IG Sergeant Major took me on a walk to, um, look at his division, as he called it. He would, he would routinely take walks just to see if everything was okay. He'd go you know, through company areas, um, uh, a lot of the training areas, just to see if anything was out of place. And one day, um, when he took me with him, I was on the wrong side. Um, I was to his um, right. And uh, he grabbed me, and he started, he grabbed my shoulders, and. I don't know how he did it, but somehow he moved me to the back of him and, um, and said, now this is where you should be, on this side of me. And then he gave me a little bit of a history lesson to explain um, you know, why soldiers um, render that, that position of respect, that those seniors should not have to, those juniors should know. And um, after that lesson, to this day, um, I will nearly run into a wall to make sure that I walk on the proper side of someone who's senior to me. Now in the National Guard, they don't really, you know, they don't hold those traditions in high regard, maybe because that's not some of the things that we were brought up with. But, um, so I, I drive some people nuts around here as we're on the opposite side and, and I'm making a big deal to get on the proper place that I should be. And as I tell the soldiers, junior soldiers, that story about my Sergeant Major, at that time and I, um, they get it and they just kind of gradually move over to the proper side. So I'm hoping that what he shared with me um, affects others too. Because in his words, um, traditions are important. It's what defines us, makes us elite um, as an organization. And once you lose your tradition, you just become like any other place in the world to work. And uh, that's that's not the case in the military. We are, are special and traditions help us to remember that I, I think. One of the other things in the IG office, I, I have to say, um, the influence of, uh, of those men in that office, um, there was also uh, two majors. Um, there was a warrant officer, uh, Chief Simmons. I'll never forget that guy. He was squared away. I just thought the guy was perfect in everything he did, um, meticulous to an end. Um, and uh, the IG at the time, Colonel Penson, um, he, he taught me some things in a subtle way. Didn't, didn't talk to the Colonel a lot, not because I couldn't, but everybody was busy and you know I had my chain of command, but 
one of the things he said to me when he was leaving the office, retiring, he said that um, that soldiers need to remember that if they don't say up, if they don't speak up, then um, no one will hear them, and you can give your opinion, and it's important that you do so, as long as you remember when to cut it off. You've had your say, and, and let those who need to make the decisions hear that information, and then you got to let it go and, and, and allow them to make decisions where, whether you agree with them or not. So, and I kept that throughout my career, that it's important that I say something, it's a value, I have something to offer if, if I feel compelled to say something. But in the end, if it's not my decision to make, I have to accept and recognize when to uh, uh, surrender myself to whatever that person in authority has to say. And uh, to this day, I, I, I remember his words um, so that, you know, it kind of keeps you out of trouble too, keeps you humble. Um, and probably one of the most influential um, sergeants in the office was uh, my uh, immediate supervisor once my, when, when the sergeant left that, that actually did the interview process, she, she moved on and then I was in that position. Um, the Sergeant Major moved on and, and one of the admin inspectors, he came up the ranks in, into the Sergeant Major role um, as NCYC of the office, um, Sergeant Rhodes. I remember as I began doing work, he looked at me and he said, I had no idea that you could do this. He said, I did not know you had the ability to perform. And uh, and when you have a buffer over a supervisor, sometimes they don't know what you can do. But I remember feeling pretty proud that sometimes it doesn't matter um, if uh, people recognize you all the time, but in those few moments when they do, you know, it, it feels pretty special and it motivates you to keep going and doing what you're supposed to do. And another guy, Master Sergeant uh, Parker, Vernon Parker, that, that guy was like, he was, he was like a, a, a big brother in the truest sense. Um, he would take me to the side and explain, you know, certain things about um, the Army and what I would expect one day. And, and just his example, leading by example, I, that, that was one of those things that um, kind of was embedded in my mind that if I don't do, I can't tell others to do. And so everything he's ever told me to do, I saw him do first. So it was the influences of the men in that office, and, and I could go on, I saw Reyes, I mean, um, that guy, comedy. I, the diversity in that office helped me to understand that um, you can be many people as a leader. Um, you just don't have to be one thing um, for everybody to see. And uh, being exposed to that and seeing those many different personalities and still knowing that all of them were special in their field, they were the top in their field, and, um, but they were all different, helped me to realize that there is no one way to do it, um, especially if the end result is still exceptional. How long were you with the uh, IG's office with 82nd? I, I was there for <coughs> two and a half years, and then, um, and at the time I didn't think I needed to move, um, but I, I, my supervisor at that time, Sergeant Rhodes, um, he felt that it was time for me to move on and, and do some other things. So he sent me out into the field, he sent me to the 313th MI Battalion. And uh, I always have to tell this joke, and I probably shouldn't, <laughs> but um, I heard it from a supply sergeant, um, Sergeant Ferguson. He would explain to everyone that, you know, they had to fill out these forms for supply, and because he was in an MI battalion, he always said, and where it says MI, don't say yes. And uh, meaning that the military intelligence personnel, they, they were book smart, but sometimes common sense didn't apply. So. Um, so first name, what do you say, last name, first name, and where it says MI, don't put yes. So uh, I, I can relate to that because good guys, don't get me wrong, but um, working with them, um, sometimes folks, uh, they, they do, they, they put what's on paper in front of what you have to execute in the moment, and sometimes the book doesn't tell you that. Um, but that was a good experience. That. Um, 
that actually, that experience um, helped me strongly in my admin background. Um, and uh, to this day, even in the, in the National Guard, as I've gone to active duty training, it's, it was my time in the battalion S1 that uh, has been implanted in my head and has helped me to survive once I was away from active duty and, and went back to it. Um, the, the S1 was, it's a busy place. Uh, there were a lot of people. I probably bonded with those personnel more than any other because we were peers for the most part. And um, I quickly learned, I was the only 71 Lima in the office at the time um, that... Now what do you mean by that? Uh, well, 74, when they 75 Bravos was the MOS of choice and that was personnel um, specialist. And uh, they were the per people who were trained to fill out all the many, many documents that the Army has to do personnel, various personnel actions. And as a Lima, I was really trained to just be a typist. And, um, and actually, I discovered 71 Limas are the backbone of the Army, <laughs> along with NCOs, but when you're talking about an MOS, they're diverse. And, um, and I still say this today because I quickly did the same exact work as those school trained 75 Bravo. So I got on, on the job training, and that's not unique to my experience, but, um, but very soon I learned a little bit of everything. And, and, and I discovered, and I didn't realize it at the time, but, but that's who I, I was. I, didn't, I wouldn't have found that out staying in the private sector. I wouldn't have known that, that I am eager um, to learn more to help an organization. I saw a need when others were out that there was no backup. So I would insert myself um, as far as finding out what a person needed and then asking, once delivering the message to the person that was supposed to handle the, the, the problem, asking them, well, how do, you, how do you fix it? If you're out again, you know, I want to be able to tell them what to do. And so very soon I learned um, all the positions um, in the office that were at my level um, of, of assignment of what I could do. And, um, and that's where I got my first award. Now, I didn't get it in the IG office. I'm a little torn on that because I saw the award written on me, but for whatever the reasons were, I didn't get it. Um, so I left and, you know, I was a little hurt by that because, you know, I thought I worked pretty hard. Um, but not too long after being in the 313th in my battalion, the adjutant um, at the time um, recommended me for an award. Um, and the reason that happened is that the whole shop, the whole S1 shop, went out to the field to do some training. I'm not quite sure why I was left behind, um, but I was. And um, for the two weeks that they were out in the field doing training, I ran the shop. Now, of course, not to the level of expertise that uh, a staff of, of about 10, I think, we had. And I, of course, I, I couldn't have run it like they did, but I didn't let things fall. Um, I was very good about taking good notes, making a list, and making sure that certain things were taken care of that needed to be timely. And I would come in early, I would stay late. I didn't do PT, so at that time, that was, you know, I, I thought that was pretty good. But I was there, um, you know, from dawn to dusk, and the adjutant noticed that. Um, and when uh, my supervisor returned, he, he, you know, he said, "This is." you know, remarkable um, work that she's done. And, and so I was award, awarded an AM for that. Um, and the adjutant gave me a coin. And to this day, it's still in the same, um, the same uh, card that he, he, he taped it inside a card and wrote a note. And to this day, that's, that's where it's, it's, it's stayed. And so it's, it's those things when you are recognized and you're not looking for it, but that someone takes the time to say, thank you, you did a good job, um, when you feel that motivates you and it sticks with you and it compels you to do it again. Not for the recognition um, and the awards, but because it made a difference. The words of someone saying, hey, you helped me, you, you made a difference in this organization. I think that's what spurred me on to, to want to do more and want to help because I helped you know, the whole office by uh, you know, contributing in my, in my own way of of trying to make sure that we didn't fall down um, and that they came back to a ton of work that they didn't understand what to do next with it. So um, so that was one of those 
uh, defining moments early in my career that um, I think has uh, helped me to be who I am today as a senior not commission officer. How long did you stay in the regular army? <clears throat> I stayed in just shy of eight years. I was, uh, I don't remember the days. I used to remember I could cite it down to the last day and hour. Um, but uh, it, it was so close that they gave me credit for completing my, um, my service obligation, my eight-year service obligation. Um, and I went after, after uh, um, the 313th in my battalion. Um, at the time, I thought that I was going to, to get out. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel um, Victor Rozell, um, standout personality, great, great battalion commander, um, who actually listened to me. It, it was you. <coughs> he trusted that I would tell him the truth. And I think that when you're in the S1 or S3, one of those uh, shops, um, those soldiers, they can get closer to a command. Um, I was the promotions clerk, and so I worked um, monthly with uh, all the first sergeants, all the commanders, and as well as the battalion command sergeant major, and uh, and not so much the, the BC, but um, somehow um, I was able to see him regu regu regularly. Um, and he, for some reason, would listen to me when I said I thought something was wrong, and he allowed me to come sit in his office, and I'd tell him, and he would give things a chance. and. That was that other lesson that it doesn't matter where it comes from. Good leaders, they listen to all of their staff. They listen to everyone because um, the more information they have to assess, the better decision they can make. And uh, so I appreciated that from him. But I remember when I was going to ETS, um, I, I was married at the time. I, I had a little one, my little Adam, who's 15, so I need to stop calling him that. Um, <laughs> I was going to get out and... and uh, my husband at the time, he was already out, and we were going to move back to Massachusetts, his home. And, uh, and then things didn't work out that way, and, and we departed ways, as is typical of many uh, soldiers. It's, it's unfortunate. And, um, and I didn't know what to do, but I thought, you know, I, I probably should get out. Well, Colonel Rosello was so funny that... No matter where he saw me, he would say, extension, you know, re-up, re -up, you know, and he would just all the time not pressure me into it, um, but just say, you know, your value to the Army, and uh, it'd be a shame if you, if you left. Um, and it made me, after a while thinking on his words, reflecting, it made me think that perhaps there was something more that I, I could do. Maybe... I had more potential than I realized, um, only because I admired this man so much, as we all did. He was well loved in uh, the battalion. And I thought, perhaps I need to see what else I, I can do um, based on his encouragement. And I did. Um, I spoke to the retention NCO and said, okay, I'm ready. Now when he, when the retention NCO first tried to get me to, to uh, um, re-enlist, and I declined, uh, a job that I thought would be great was open, and that was as a, um, a paralegal um, clerk, or whatever it was called. Uh, I think it was 27 Delta. But anyway, um, that wasn't open when I decided that, yeah, now I, I do want to go ahead and re-enlist. But what came up was, was something else that I thought was kind of cool, but never thought I would be eligible to do, and, and that was working um, as a photo journalist. So it ended up that because my first supervisor, um, Sergeant Salee was her name, Holly Salee, uh, she got married, it's changed to McKenna. Uh, so I'm amazed that I remember this stuff. Um, because she sent me to what they called, uh, I think it was FAST, F-A-S-T, and I don't remember what it stands for now, but my GT score was low. It was 109. Okay to get in, but not to do anything you want in the Army. She sent me to that, I think it was a two-week program, and it was to prepare you in the area of, uh, areas of mathematics and um, 
in language arts. And once you complete the course, it somehow helps you better prepare to take the uh, ASVAB test. At any rate, upon completion, my score drastically went up to 122. Um, when I first took it, I wasn't really taking it too seriously. I'm not sure if there were distractions or what was going on, but that's what I scored, and, and I didn't know it, was a, it wasn't the best score, and my recruiter says, oh, it's fine. And uh, so I didn't take it over. Well, once I joined the Army, I realized that uh, it probably could be better. You need a 110 GT score or higher um, to kind of have your wish list of things. So um, with that 122, I was guaranteed to pick, you know, I had a broader selection of things. So public affairs was on that list. And um, you were supposed to have some type of proof of uh, ability to write. Well, I really didn't have anything, but through my time in S1, um, because I had no college, um, I had rewritten some awards for, for personnel so that they could be approved. And it was just on my own. I'm not quite sure how I fell into it, but there was a sergeant from one of the subordinate companies um, who was recommended for an MSM, and it was downgraded. Well. Once I started talking to him and I looked at the recommendation, I rewrote it, and it was just that I discovered the uh, officer who wrote it just wasn't a strong writer, and it was approved. So I used that as an example of demonstrated ability to write, and, um, and they bought off on it, and I was able to go. So I left uh, Fort Bragg, my beloved home. I love Fayetteville. I love Fort Bragg. I enjoyed North Carolina a great deal and uh, was sad to go, but at the same time, knew I had to move on to something else. So I reclassed um, as a photojournalist at Fort Meade, Maryland, and um, it was uh, it was tough. That, that was some tough training. I thought I was pretty bright. I, I thought, well, I speak fairly well, and you know, I know sentence structure, and uh, I did, you know, pretty well in, in, uh, in English, and um, I took that initial examination because not only did you have to prove you could get in and you had to have certain score line scores, but once you got there, they screened you again and you had to take a test. Well, I recall that I barely passed that test. There were not many points in between failing and passing. And uh, that humbled me quickly. And I thought, but I, I knew everything. I was comfortable with these answers. And um, so I learned the hard way. There, there's a, a lot more to uh, writing than, than I learned in high school. And um, so the journalism portion um, in the beginning was pretty rough. I, the gift that I had, however, was telling the story. Um, so what I lacked in mechanics, and, and when I mean mechanics, they were minor things that no one else would catch, like where to put that comma or um, you know, not using one transition versus another, um, which at the time to me seemed like, oh, that's minor. It, it's pretty big when you're trying to clearly tell a story. And, uh, and I thought, I'll never figure this stuff out. And I have to backtrack because my battalion uh, commander was so good, and, and, the, and his staff, the, and my, my NCOs, they were so good to me that they allowed me to do an on-the-job training in the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office. So I did, I think I was there for maybe 30 days, and uh, the goals, they were bright. The, 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 the soldiers assigned there, I thought, oh, I'm not gonna be able to do this. And uh, I, I think um, Sar, I think she's a SAR Major now, Costello, um, wonderful lady. Um, she picked my stuff apart, and I just thought, oh, boy, I'm in trouble now. And I remember doing a story that um, years later someone recalled, and, and it was because of my ability to, to try to paint a picture and, and tell a story. So anyway, in school, that's what I relied on, that I didn't want it to be boring, I wanted people to read it. So I relied on my imagination to make my lead-ins, which is the key to a, a, a writer's story, to pull you into the story and keep you throughout. So um, that's where I found my niche. News writing, that's another story. And it's a formula. It, it, you would think it'd be easier, but for me, because it, it lacked imagination, um, you know, I'd get through it. But, I, you know, I, I struggled a bit um, getting through that course. Um, the photojournalism, I thought doing the 
photography portion, oh, that would be a breeze. It's not. You, they would give you 10 rolls of film, and you had to use it all within a certain period of time, and you had to capture certain elements um, um, of uh, frames. You had to, you know, the, the long view, short, uh, uh, close-ups, um, medium um, range. So, uh, and, and it seems very simple until you have to do it and come up with something focused and good and of interest. Um, but, but I made it through and, and that was the most fun, it's enjoyable, and I used the skills that I learned there um, today. And I actually did better in, the, in uh, the photo portion than I did the journalism. I finally got the journalism towards the end, but that was a little too late. Um, but I got through it and, uh, and, and I enjoyed that experience. Um, a great deal too. So and after after uh, school, I was fortunate enough. Uh, well, at, towards the end of my time in school, I met um, Sergeant Gina Gaskin. We became close friends. She was going through an advanced course um, at Fort Meade, and uh, we we talked. I was helping her move in because we were both. Uh, uh, prior service, and so we lived separately from the AIT students. Anyway, we we began to talk, and she was telling me how she was at West Point, and boy, they were looking for somebody, and did I have an assignment? And I did. I was supposed to go to Colorado. And uh, something happened, and I, I wasn't going to be assigned to Fort Carson anymore. I was informed of it, and, and so we didn't know where I was going to go. Well, I went back to... Uh, Gina Gaskin and said, hey, I don't have a place to go. And, and so fortunately there was a instructor, he was a civilian, who jumped in and, and helped me to be reassigned to West Point. So, and, and that was pretty good in that um, my former in-laws, um, or soon to be former in-laws, they lived um, in Rotterdam, New York, near Schenectady, and that was only an hour and a half or so away from West Point. So I thought, this is great. So I, I Worked for the worked for the Pointer View, um, the West Point paper, and I did that for about a year and a half, and uh, and I realized that I am no um, Lois Lane. <laughs> I, I just didn't enjoy it. I, I thought my my stories were solid, but I didn't have the desire of, of what a journalist should have to do that kind of work. So I got through this the cycle of. Um, working there and it, there was an opportunity that came up to work in the company and we had an extra um, journalist on staff. So I asked permission to move um, and it was granted um, and uh, it was a wonderful fit. That's where I learned, uh, I used my <coughs> skills from the 313th, 313th in my battalion to work as um, the operations um, NCO in that office, so running the admin side of the house for the company, and uh, en enjoyed that greatly. And at the end of a year, um, my ETS was up, and uh, and then I debated on whether or not I would stay or or um, try something else. And I decided that um, because I hadn't done an overseas tour, and I might need to go to Korea. Um, and I was a single parent. I, I loved the Army so much that I thought it was unfair for me to use my child to try to get out of any type of assignment. So, and I wasn't ready to uh, allow my three-year-old to, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't ready to allow my three-year-old to be without me. So I decided to um, ETS and uh, um, try my luck in the private sector because I didn't have anything to c compare it to. I always thought I'd go back in the Army if, if it doesn't work out. So I did that with no great plan, um, no education beyond high school, and um, in believing that somebody's gonna want me because, well, I've done some pretty good things in, in the military, so it shouldn't be that hard. Um, well, I found out that's not true. Um, people won't even look at you or give you a chance sometimes if you have a degree. You may have the skills, but you don't have a paper that says um, that I can do the work. So um, it was a little rough, but uh, fortunately for me, um, because I had humble beginnings growing up, um, I, I had a little bit of a savings knowing that I, I was going to get out of the military. So I relied on that 
time on terminal leave and whatever savings I had to get me through the rough spots of trying to find employment. And um, that was pretty rough. We, we can go a little okay. bit longer. Two more minutes. Um, and then we go to another table. Okay. Um, what I did, I, I thought, okay, I, I have some skill sets from the Army, so I did my resume. I went through ACAP first, so they kind of let you know what's out there, um, what you need to expect um, when you're going to transition from military life to, to civilian life. So I had my books in hand, all, all of that training, um, my military experience, and um, you know what I thought was common sense. So I figured I'm, I got a plan and, and I'm going to be able to uh, tackle this beast of trying to find employment um, after uh, my time in the military. And uh, I d did my resumes, um, got the nice paper, did all the things I was supposed to do, and nobody was calling me. And I thought, gee, what's going on? And I sent out tons. And eventually I started getting uh, a bit of nibbles, and I had a few interviews, and, and then I discovered for the first time in one of them that I thought, this is the right job, this is going to be the right fit that I didn't have the, the skills that I thought I had um, in computer literacy. Um, I didn't know as much as I thought. Okay, let's hold that thought. Okay. <laughs>
think that I have potential to do some other things. Um, and at the time when he knew that um, more than likely he would not be able to retain me um, because he was going in different directions, he uh, actually uh, contracted me out to a skilled nursing facility and uh, I did some work for them. It, it was just a um, one little project. And through that project and working there, um, the personnel there, they were satisfied with my work and there happened to be another position that opened. And uh, it was full time and it was working um, in physician, in the business office of one of the skilled nursing facilities. So um, I interviewed for it and, and it didn't take long to say, oh, yeah, we'll give you a chance. So so I did that and learned the job pretty well. It wasn't, it wasn't too difficult. Um, I was really in processing personnel into the facility um, on the billing side and um, handling a patient account. Um, and I just thought, well, they're trusting me with these people's money. I, I just really never handled anyone's money but my own. So that, that was a little intimidating at first. And um, soon my coworker, who really was, he, he was a uh, accountant by trade, um, he left to do some other things, and so I was thrust into doing two roles in an area that I was not comfortable in at all. And so I learned the harshness of, of uh, accounting, that it's not really about adding and subtracting, but um, different concepts. And, um, and it took me forever to get to, to come to the same conclusion as a trained accountant, so I had much respect for, for doing that work. Um, and then I stayed at that facility, but realized it, I wasn't really happy. I, I, I was out of my league in that I wasn't properly trained um, to do the work. And, uh, and, and the, the uh, atmosphere of the new ownership was such that um, I didn't think that I, I would stay there very long. It just wasn't a happy place to work anymore. Um, things weren't as forgiving for those who weren't properly trained. Um, and uh, even though everybody thought my work was great, I just didn't feel like I was contributing to the best of my ability. So um, I decided that um, if it, another opportunity came up, I would take it. Well, one didn't. So, you know, I stuck around and, and I, uh, you know, did the best I could and, you know, everything was okay on the surface. And uh, in the meantime, there was someone else who was hired to work in my old position and uh, her work wasn't too good, and so when the new ownership came, I found myself alone again. And I just thought for the money that I was making, I think it was $23,000 um, a year, uh, not even quite that, I think it was $22,500. Um, that's, that's tough to make it, a uh, um, single parent um, on that salary. I just thought, I'm working way too hard uh, for the amount of money that they want to compensate me with. And uh, I really realized that upon learning that a new hire for a facility that had less responsibility, um, the, the skilled nursing facility that I worked for, um, you had to do private insurance, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, and the facility that this new person uh, was working for, they really only did Medicare and Medicaid, which was a lot easier. So anyway, um, and she made about $10,000 more than me, so I was a little bit upset by that and thought, well, I have to still do the work, but I, I really need to look somewhere else. Well, before I looked somewhere else, I thought um, I, I was making a move, and uh, it was strange that I, I got a part-time job because ends were not being met very well. They, they were, but it wasn't comfortable, and I wanted my son to have some of his wants and not just his needs, and I rarely could give him a want. So uh, I got a part-time job, and my first night, I was speaking to one of the people training me, and we started talking about the military. She was in the military, and she was telling me her story. And I said, oh, I happened to, I was in the military for nearly eight years, and you know, she was like, wow. And so we had that conversation, um, and then I was moving things into storage, and my father-in-law was helping me, and. He took a different route than we normally had taken to, to move these uh, um, items into storage. And um, we passed a recruiting station, and he said, hey, Michelle, look at that, a 
a recruiting station. And I'm like, oh yeah. And then, uh, so I, I dismissed that as well. And then I got home. Um, and then for the next day and a half, I kept seeing um, advertisements for the National Guard. Now, the whole time I had been out, which was nearly a year and a half, um, I didn't see any of that. I never really saw commercials um, about joining the Guard or anything like that. Hadn't run across any recruiting stations, anything that linked me back to the military. And uh, the last straw was uh, later that, I think it was the second night of these weird occurrences happening in, in my mind. They weren't weird until the last one. I went into Walmart, went into that Walmart many, many times. And that night I happened to be wearing an airborne sweatshirt. Rarely wore it, but it was cool that night. It was the first thing I grabbed, put it on, and went into Walmart and there was a recruiting um, booth set up. And uh, the recruiter started yelling, hey, airborne. And I'm thinking, well, he's not talking to me. And then I happened to look realized what t-shirt I was wearing, or sweatshirt I was wearing, and I thought, oh, he is talking to me. So then I instantly, I thought, something's going on here. I am trying to, a message is, is being delivered to me, and I better listen. So um, when I went up to him, I said, um, what document do you have for me to, to complete so that uh, we can start the application process? And his mouth dropped, and I said, you don't have to say anything. I said, I'm prior service. I said, you probably know that, and I said, uh, there's something that tells me that, that I need to join again, and, uh, and I did. And um, six months later, after joining the 56 PSB here in Latham, uh, I was offered an opportunity to interview for a full-time position, doing exactly what I did at West Point, um, running the admin section in, in uh, my company. And uh, I interviewed, and, and it was my active duty time that gave me the edge. I was an outsider. I, I hadn't been in um, the National Guard very long. And uh, there were quite a few vying for the position. Um, I think it was around 12, maybe, I'm told, um, that wanted that, that position uh, in, in the 56. And, and by the points system, thank goodness, um, I just edged out some other folks. And what was interesting to me is that I kind of knew these, the people who were interviewing me, um, uh, one of my mentors um, who, who has since um, left us, uh, Sergeant Major LaGrange. I get so emotional because uh, he, uh, he, he, was a, he was a true command Sergeant Major. And uh, he mentored me um, coming into the Guard. And he was tough. But uh, he, he was endless with knowledge and, and, you know, was somewhat of a father figure to me. Um, now, when did you go back in? I went back in in uh, December uh, 1999. I'm sorry. It's that's, just that's okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, you know, I knew Sergeant Major LaGrange briefly. You know, you don't really talk to the battalion Sergeant Major so much. Um, I knew the uh, Battalion XO, Major Van Court, but I rarely even spoke to these, these people and they were on the board along with uh, Sergeant First Class Farrell and I didn't really know him at all and, and when I walked in that interview, it was like they never saw me before and so I thought, boy, this is a fair process and um, you know, I just delivered myself at, as I should in the most honest way possible and um, I was fortunate enough that um, my active duty experience, I believe, is, is what um, set me apart from, just slightly, from the other candidates. And so that was a good thing. That was the end of um, my misery in the private sector. Um, I'll make sure when I leave the, the next time um, from the Army that I'm a little better prepared than I was the last. So it all told a um, year and a half, just about, um, in the private sector before uh, I rejoined the um, rejoined as a uh, or the active status. I was six months M day soldier, and uh, during that time, I, you know, I, I was trying to run the office. That's what I was supposed to do part time, and I would take the initiative to try to, you know, do certain things because I knew how to do it. 
And I think that's what, um, you know, why the offer that, hey, this position is opening, you should at least apply for it. So, and I was discouraged by others. Don't apply for that. You're, you're not in. You're not in the guard. You're not part of the buddy system. And, but I said, you know what? Hey, I'm no worse off if, if, uh, if I don't get it, but I'll, I'll at least try. Um, prior to that year and a half lapse, um, or I should say prior to December 1999, um, just about, it, right, right when I got out actually, I did try to join the National Guard, even though it was against my grain to do it, but I thought, gee, eight years, I shouldn't waste that, I should continue service. But I didn't have the best experience with the recruiter at the time, so it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth, and, and I thought, it's either all or nothing, either I, I rejoin the active force or, you know, or I don't do it at all. So. Um, that's why when all the signs in my mind, you know, I, I think it was the good Lord telling me, you've been suffering now, this is your chance to uh, come out of that, that, you know, slump that you're in in the private sector. And I, and I read that as signs to do that, and, um, and the timing was just perfect. So um, ever since then, my life has certainly um, resumed in the way that it should, in, in the way that I had left from active duty. And um, I've grown as a person, and I've been able to reach, um, not my full potential yet, but I have cer I'm certainly getting close um, to that level of excellence that, that I saw in those uh, non-commissioned officers um, so long ago, back in 1991, when I joined the Inspector General's office in the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, I admired those guys throughout my whole career. And, uh, and, uh, and if I could see them today, I think they, I, I, I might make them a little bit proud. Um, so after my time in the 56 PSB, I, I was the uh, personnel um, services NCO at the battalion level. Um, learned a great deal, mentored <coughs> by Sergeant Major LaGrange, um, wealth of knowledge, just endless. Um, he would make you wait for it for a while. We, I used to say he was processing data. I'd ask him a question. He would just flicker his eyes, you know, just, and I'm waiting. And I'm like, is he going to answer me or not? And I didn't know what to do. And uh, he was coming up with whatever I needed to know. So he never sent me the wrong way. And I have never met anyone who has been so on and so exact in guiding you to where you need to find answers to any anything that you, you could come up with. Um, and I imagine that's because he had quite a few years in service. Um, and, and that that experience um, leads you to that uh, leads you to that ability. And uh, Major Van Court at the time, she's a lieutenant colonel now, she um, um, she was she was wonderful. She was a good boss. Um, caring, um, disciplined, um, She's what gets me organized, although she saw my desk today, she'd be a little disappointed, but she's the one that, that got, got me in the habit of um, looking at a task that's overwhelming, taking a deep breath, and dissecting it into smaller tasks so that you can get it done. And uh, that's how I learned to enjoy my work. No matter how big the task is, it doesn't, it doesn't phase me, it doesn't discourage me. Um, and I truly learned that from her example. And uh, so that'll stick with me, I'm sure, for the rest of my days, whether I'm in uniform or not. After the 56 PSB, I was fortunate enough to be selected for uh, Sergeant First Class. I came in as a sergeant, was promoted um, to Staff Sergeant upon getting the full-time position, and then further advanced um, into uh, the readiness NCO position as Sergeant First Class. Uh, there was my challenge. If, if I didn't have one before, that was the first time that I had to take everything I had learned to date and uh, apply it. And uh, you don't know what you're made of until you're forced um, to perform. And uh, to, to my delight, not so much my surprise, um, but that, that I did it well. I knew I would try, I knew I'd give effort, but to my delight, it was I, were, I was doing good things. I was doing more than I imagined I could do. And um, that meant some extra time um, before, after work. Um, it, it, was, it was not easy, but it was important because there were 
44 soldiers um, looking to me to be ready um, for training. They were, they, I needed to be ready for them so that they could do something productive that day uh, as they come in to drill. And, uh, and, and I grew, um, you know, the mentorship that I, that I was able to get from others, um, it, it, uh, it, it, it showed in me. And, um, and then I discovered that it's not just what I learned from those senior to me, but those who are junior to me that helps me grow. So that experience as a squad leader and then a platoon sergeant um, and full-time readiness NCO, um, that prepared me for uh, the deployment that was not too far off uh, after taking that position. A um, couple years, but going to war, um, you can't have enough training. You just cannot have enough. Um, and so during that time, what happened was uh, our unit was identified to fill some vacant positions in the 42nd um, Infantry Division in their G1 shop. Well, they identified they wanted six, well, they, they had different numbers. They, I think they came up with 13, and, and I looked at their UMR and determined they didn't need that many. Um, you know, the MACOM uh, Chief of Staff agreed, and the the number was agreed upon six. Because of course, I don't want them to take all of our folks um, because our sister unit was identified to deploy at some point as well. So anyway, um, six personnel were slated to go. And I also knew the 29th deployment was coming up. And, and I felt that if soldiers went with them, they would be protected because we knew each other to a degree. And I knew their readiness in CO, Sergeant uh, Scott. Um, and then I had to make a decision. I wasn't slated to go. Nobody was looking for me. I was a sergeant first class. They wanted sergeants and, and specialists. And, and then I made a decision that, um, that I needed to go. Um, I had trained, you know, trained these soldiers from the time they entered the unit to the point where we were going to ask them to put their lives in jeopardy. And, uh, and I just didn't think it was right that someone in their senior leadership wouldn't be there um, to lead them along that way. And so I started to make my campaign to, to go to the, to the division. And, uh, and I won. Um, you know, I got what I asked for. And, uh, <laughs> and sometimes I thought, why did I do this? And it only took me looking at not just the soldiers that came over with me, but the other ones to say, that, that's why you do it. Um, not that I thought I was better than anyone, but I knew I was balanced. I knew I was compassionate. Um, I knew I could cry one moment for a soldier's uh, well-being, uh, alone of course. Um, it, but I knew I could be hard as nails to make sure they perform and get up to standard um, because that's the only way they're going to survive. You, you have to train as you're going to fight and to accept less um, will put their lives in, in jeopardy. And so um, working with the division and uh, working towards the deployment, um, certainly certainly has made me grow um, and those experiences will be lasting as well and of course um, I'm better today than I was prior to the deployment and and all those things that just make you better happen during that deployment um, whether they were good or bad um, we're not always pleased with the circumstances but you take what you can from them and make something beneficial out of it and uh, and that's what I did and I hope that in part that I influenced um, some of the soldiers that were in my charge to do the same in their career. Uh, I was the platoon sergeant eventually um, uh, for the G1, and uh, well, that was 40, 43 uh, soldiers, uh, 43 young people, um, with all these different personalities with um, a lack of discipline that unfortunately the guard doesn't always provide because we only see soldiers once a month and uh, we figured it out and, and we got it together and um, with the other leadership of course uh, we all came back thank goodness um, intact and and hopefully just a little better off than when we left and uh, I don't regret going um, the, the one thing that I do regret is that 
Um, sometimes when you're a soldier and you're so focused on the mission that you can, you know, you can forget about family. And uh, my son was with his grandparents, uh, my former in-laws, who um, loved him. He loved them, and I thought that's enough. And uh, and I guess as a soldier, um, you know, I I was so focused on making sure those junior to me um, got back that that I forgot that perhaps my son wouldn't have fared as well in my absence and. Uh, you know, and that was the case. It, it was, uh, you know, a, a, a time period where, um, you know, you, you miss you miss a lot um, when your kids they're growing and you're not there to see it. And uh, so, if it, to do it all over again, um, you know, I knowing what I know now, I, I I would because I know the whole story and you know I know my value um, to the soldiers that. I served with, um, but I think um, I would have, while in garrison, I would have um, taken a little more time to not put work in front of me. Because when war comes, you, you have to go. You have to, but do I need to get that one more report in, you know, um, in garrison? Yes, it's, it's important, but is it more important than my family? Um, you know, not so much. Um, you know, trying to make sure someone's life uh, is intact. That is not more important than family, but it is important if you have a role, if you have a role in, in doing that. And uh, so given the opportunity um, to make that choice again, if I knew I was the person who had to go, um, I would go, but I would be awfully careful to make sure that, that my son is ready too. Um, and it is true that we get ready and we prepare and we train. I didn't do that for my son and that's regrettable on my part. Um, so today, in retrospect, you know, I make sure that there's certain things that we talk about, there's certain things he understands, there's, there's another way he can express himself um, so that he doesn't feel like he's without me. And, uh, um, you take a parent out of a child's life, um, it doesn't matter who it is, um, they're going to have ill effects of that. So um, so uh, I know my time may come around again, and uh, like my thoughts when I left West Point, I, I'll never use my child, my family, as a way to get out of a mission. So uh, I need to do my part um, to be prepared. And um, some family members think that that's callous of me. Um, to put my job um, in front of family, but I'm not. I, I am not just a mother, and I'm not just a soldier. So I'm obligated because I've chosen this uh, field um, to make it work. And if, if I can't make it work, I need to hang up the uniform. Um, we're, we're not GE, we're not anyone else in corporate America. And uh, if, we don't, if we don't put that in the forefront of our minds that, um, we need to love our family, care for them, take care of them, but we do this so that they will stay safe. And that means that I can't, um, keeping my son safe means that sometimes uh, I, I may have to pick up arms and, uh, you know, not literally go out on the battlefield, because um, we're in trouble if uh, an admin sergeant is out on the battlefield, but um, leading the charge. But um, what it does mean is I gotta be out there too. I have to do my part, um, in the in the whole operation of the army, my piece is just as important as that infantryman. I, I got to support him so that his focus is not on anything that I should have taken care of, but on his mission. And uh, and I want to be there um, for them to do my part to ensure that my family is safe at home and and, uh, and our nation as a whole. Now you went to Iraq. I did. When were you there? I was there, um, I was on the advance party. Um, mm -hmm. We were in Kuwait um, from, uh, you, you think I would remember this, um, we were there in, from October, end of October um, through Janu the middle of January. Um, and, and then uh, our happiness in our little small world in Kuwait, um, because we, came, we became family, that small advance party. 
and the rest of the main body came over and <laughs> you know the fun really began um, but uh, while we were in Kuwait um, Camp Beery um, not the most pretty place but I guess it's not supposed to be um, it uh, we, we set up operations, getting prepared for the main body to come over, establishing certain procedures, and um, and I was a part of that as the NCYC and, and the G1. And, um, that was a good time. I learned a lot. We worked hard, and uh, and we boohooed uh, at Christmas time, and you know for you know big holiday away from the family, um, and then we we learned to rely on each other, and uh, we got through. We we laughed and. You know, people were upset with each other, but basically we lived. We lived. We figured it out, and, and we were okay. And the Army's so good to us that, um, you know, I, I didn't imagine we'd have as much support as we did. Um, free mail, mailings for, you know, a regular postage, uh, uh, something that would be a regular stamp, a uh, cost of regular um, stamp, or I'm saying it wrong, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> free um, postage. <laughs> free postage, yeah. I just couldn't put them together. Oh. But, um, you know, you can you could reach out to your family. If you didn't have the Internet, you could always write. And the art of writing is lost, and, and that's a beautiful thing. People keep those forever. And uh, be, I had email, so uh, I got a little lazy. And, and I would email my family, and, and you could call. And uh, we had DSN numbers, and they'd connect us here from Latham which was very kind of them to do so, connect us to our families at any given time of the day. So um, we didn't suffer. We weren't, it was like calm, almost like garrison um, environment. If you were one of those admin types or, you know, um, combat service support. Um, so I didn't have a rough time. Um, I kept it in perspective. Other people thought it was horrible and I thought, Gee, I'm in a covered building. I thought it was going to be like MASH. That's what I thought going to war would look like, and it didn't resemble that at all. Um, so after we moved from Kuwait and in, uh, into Iraq, um, that was a uh, uh, same thing. I just thought the way that the army took care of us, as far as trying to make things as comfortable and as familiar as possible of what we're used to. Um, anywhere we serve, um, I was impressed with it. Was everything perfect? Well, of course not. If you, if you look hard enough, no, it's not. But I didn't even expect, I didn't expect close to perfection. So for me, my personal opinion, um, it, it wasn't a hard time at all. The toughest thing was just being away from your family. Um, and if you can somehow figure out how to adjust to that, and the Army gave you opportunities. Once again, email was available, um, phones were available. Um, you could survive, you, you could do it. So uh, I was able to concentrate on um, mission accomplishment with no problem and, and taking care of those soldiers. And, uh, and, and we did that on the best shift that's out there. Um, we did that on the, the night shift. And uh, that's a shift no one wanted mm -hmm. until we uh, eventually made them realize that's the shift you want to be on. Um, the day walkers, as we called them, um, they had to contend with the heat. They had to contend with the command personality. Um, you know, uh, with with each other. There's more people walking around in the day, and there's more fuss going on um, <clears throat> on the night shift. Uh, that team of people, they they were remarkable. Um, now, we may not have started off as a well-oiled oiled machine at first, but that was my job. That was my job to figure out how to pull out the best out of all of us, and and we did that. And Sergeant Major LaGrange, um, who emailed me regular, on a regular basis, as well as another soldier who um, had grown close to him, um, Stacy Grant, um, his words rung out. He said, treat your soldiers well. He said, uh, in return, they will more than surprise you. They will more than surpass your expecta expectations. And he's right. He, he was right on the money with that. Um, I treated the soldiers well. You know, I tried to be the leader I was supposed to be. And, uh, you know, in, in return, they worked hard. They delivered. Um, they did things that I wouldn't have imagined we would be able to accomplish. And, um, and, and you, you let a soldier pull out their talents. 
Um, you don't hold them down. Um, whether they knew something that I didn't know and they could perform better, great. That's, that's your mission now. That's your task. And you'll get us all squared away so that we can perform to the same level that you, that you are able to on that particular task. And that's how we worked. We worked as a team. And um, one, was no, one was not more important than the other. Um, and I explained to them, yes, I'm the star in first class. You're the specialist. I don't know everything. Um, but I'm expected to make sure everything gets done. There is a difference. I'm not better than you as a person. Um, I just have different responsibilities as an NCO versus your level of responsibilities as a sergeant in five or a specialist. And, um, and, and I share that philosophy with them that they are an equal part of any Army team and they should never let anyone tell them different. And if they do, they shouldn't feel that way. That's the shortcoming of that leader. And uh, that's the way we work. We all su uh, supported each other. I got food for them. They got food for me when we couldn't make it to chow. Um, you know, we, we made sure people had things um, at the PX if one couldn't go. And, uh, and we soon became uh, a little family. We would have uh, once a week, I'd say, hey, you know, we, sh we should eat together, and we did. And uh, we talked and laughed, and um, to this day, we still share stories of those experiences. So I've been able to keep in touch um, with, with all of those soldiers. And the most hard-headed of those soldiers, uh, he's deployed again. And the, one of the biggest compliments that I think I got from the soldier was from him. He emailed me, and he said, he says, Sergeant Lindsay, he says, boy, I remember how tough you were. And I just thought, that, oh, man, that woman. You know, I'm sure he said some choice words. And he said, uh, he said, you know what? I wish you were here with me today. He said, they have no clue. The leaders, they, they are failing at every turn. And, and uh, you know, I'm scared to go with them. And, um, but, and I wrote him back and I said, but you know what to do. Be humble as you... Uh, introduce some different possibilities for them, um, you know, as far as what their next plan is on accomplishing something. Um, he had a problem with a bit of humility, but um, I said, you know, you've lived it. Let them know that you've lived it and that you have some resources that might be helpful to them. And I said, soon they'll start to listen to you. And, uh, and so, um, he seems to be doing fine. He emailed me two weeks ago, and which reminds me, uh, I got a sitting Kool Aid. <laughs> he wants me to sit in Kool Aid, so I got to do that. Um, but anyway, just essentially, I, I guess from that whole deployment experience, it, experience, it, it taught me that um, that you don't know what's going to happen from day to day, um, and you have to give your very best in the day that you have in that moment. And um, you can plan for tomorrow, and uh, in that planning, it shouldn't be mine alone. It, it's got to be with the involvement of those junior soldiers. Those who were left in my charge, I had a responsibility that if I wasn't there, they needed to know what to do. They shouldn't rely on me to come up with the answer. And uh, towards the end of the deployment, they didn't need me. I, I could have left and no one would have spotted me again and they wouldn't have known a difference in the operation. And I think that's the biggest accomplishment that a leader should want to have is that your, your soldiers don't need you anymore. And, uh, and that did happen. I, I did leave to go uh, run another mission at another um, uh, forward operating base. And at that site, um, unfortunately, uh, those soldiers had to, they had to adhere to um, my method. And at first it may seem a little harsh until the rationale comes out. And, uh, but the team that I left, um, they were phenomenal. Um, I heard nothing but praises. I'd still check their work at the end, um, just out of curiosity. Um, but they never missed a beat. They, they were on it. And, and I was truly proud of them, um, that they performed it as they did. Uh, the new team, uh, we, didn't, we weren't with each other for too long, but uh, they soon learned that Sergeant Lindsay is okay, but Sergeant Lindsay, um, she's old school, and uh, I can uh, attribute some of that to, once again, my time in the IG. Uh, those guys, they were hard, they molded me, and uh, they're, they're still with me today. And uh, 
coming off the deployment, um, near the end, um, I was surprised by an email. It, it, it shocked me, and to this day, I, I, I'm still in shock that I received it. It was from uh, Colonel McDonough, um, the primary inspector general for New York Army National Guard, and offering me a position in the IG office. Now, prior to deployment and just understanding the Guard, I knew I would never be an IG. It, it has always been my dream job. As a PFC, I said, one day I'm going to be like these guys. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be an IG. Well, in, in the National Guard system, it seemed like there were only two master sergeants and um, the position everyone was always vying for it. And you know what? I had given up and said, eh, that won't be me. And uh, so you just work hard and do what you're supposed to do and try to figure out what your other dream job is. And um, so when I got that email offering me the position, I closed it. And, and I sat back in my chair, and then I opened it again, read it again, and thought, this is not real. And, uh, and so I replied right away and, and, and said, you know, I, would, I was elated by the offer, and I would certainly love to the opportunity to become an, an IG. And um, so a couple months prior to leaving theater, I knew where my next assignment was going to be. And, uh, um, when I came back to uh, Fort Drum, and, uh, and by the way, when I went to that other site to, to run an operation, I, I left slightly earlier than I was supposed to, a few weeks early, but my son needed me in, in such a way that I was allowed to leave early. And uh, that was the first time in my career that I asked to quit. I say quit in that um, I didn't finish my task. I had trained others to do so. Um, and I felt, and I stayed a couple of extra days, and I needed to to make sure everything was online because that's the nature of, you know, when you're responsible for something. But um, it, it was important that that you know I, I get back home to my son, and uh, um, and that was that was pretty big for me to say, I quit. I can't do it. Somebody else needs to. Um, I need to be somewhere else. And fortunately, uh, they bought off on my reasons and. Uh, and I came home um, to be with my son, and uh, and he's he's okay. He's he's all right. Um, so much so that he think I think he wants me to go back somewhere because um, <laughs> the rules are back in in place. Um, so as I um, finished my emergency leave situation, I reported back to Fort uh, Drum, lovely Fort Drum. I like it. It's cold. I don't like that part, but. I didn't have a problem. A lot of people don't like Fort Trump. Um, but anyway, um, I ended up joining the team that was going to outprocess the entire division that would uh, demob at a Fort Trump. Now, I was supposed to just report back and then outprocess. But my nature, I saw that uh, one of my favorite people ever, he was, he was my boss, my direct supervisor um, for a while at Fort Drum before we deployed, but his name was Master Sergeant Kevin Ivory. Uh, wonderful guy, just full of energy, bright, just uh, can fix fix anything, fix those problems. Um, he didn't really have a staff, and uh, he had somebody in the band, two people from the band working for him, but they weren't necessarily admin people, and there just weren't enough people, and as well as the warrant officer. Um, I, I admire this this guy. He's he's. Uh, he was just, just amazing. Um, he was an active duty warrant officer who came to, to save the National Guard. And, and he did. He did. He, he helped the G1 out immensely. Um, but what happened was um, I found myself not out processing, but helping with the operation, helping everyone else out process. So I ended up staying uh, maybe a little over a month more than I, it was planned. But I felt, you know. I was home, my son was okay, he was accepting that I'm not deployed, I'm, I'm not in harm's way, and so we got through that. Um, but in that process, um, I wasn't taking care of myself again. As is typical of leaders, you, you're taking care of other folks and, and you're an afterthought, but um, not, a, not a big sacrifice, but um, trying to get ready for IG duty and giving them all the things they need, that, that was somewhat of a of a conflict, trying to do two things at once. 
But soon after I completed my time uh, up at Fort Drum, I took a little time off and went away for training. Maybe a week after I reported back, I had a week in the office, went to uh, uh, Virginia to uh, go to the IG school. Wonderful school. I think every leader should go through it. And uh, returned to my dream job and where I am today. And I tell you, uh, there, there's no uh, shortage of work in the IG world. Uh, I love it. I take a deep breath every day because it's, uh, it's, it's challenging at times. It's exhausting always, but um, it's what I want to do. And uh, now that I've you know, done my dream job, um, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do next. So I'll have to figure that out. Well, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome. Very good interview. I'm sorry I was so chatty, but no, I wanted to give you a You did an excellent job. Excellent, excellent interview. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you doing any